Hey cookies! So later on in today's episode, um, if you keep watching, it's a little bit of a long one, but if you can be patient, there's a lot of super cool information. Um, my guest is going to talk about a church that once stood on this spot, spot in Fitchburg. So just to kind of give you a little bit of understanding of where we are. Over here is the delicious espresso pizza. And there's the public library. Okay, so this park is actually Monument Park. And when you listen to the video with David, you're gonna find out that um, the church that stood here had guest speakers who were like huge important people in the world of the abolitionist movement, including Lucy Stone, who was also a um, major advocate for the women's vote in our country, um, including William Lloyd Garrison, who very famously, famously is the head of the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, and Frederick Douglass walked on this sidewalk and stood on these grounds and spoke here. It's a really cool connection. Watch on. Hey Cookies, Pav here. Hope everybody's doing well. Um, today we are going to kind of wrap up some of the work that you've been doing around Frederick Douglass in my class and Mr. Rosano's class. And I brought in a guest who is here to kind of let us know about how the abolitionist movement connects to the community in Pittsburgh and in the surrounding towns. Um, his name is David. Um, he has connections to Sizer School. He did some work with us back in the early years with Ms. May. Um, and currently he's an academic advisor at Mount Wachusett Community College. Hi, David. Hi. Thanks for having me today. Thank you for being here. Um, so we're really excited to learn how all this work we've been doing around Frederick Douglass links to our local community. Awesome. Yeah happy to, to share the information that I have with you. So um, so basically uh, in Fitchburg, uh, just kind of give you a little bit of uh, background. Um, I teach a class called First Year Experience at Mount Wachusett Community College and I teach that in the fall semester, spring semester, and the summer semester. Mm -hmm. In um, the summer semester of 2017, my students uh, read the narrative of Frederick Douglass and part of the curriculum was to uh, to research the uh, abolitionist movement as it connects to Fitchburg mm -hmm. um, and uh, when they were doing that it so happened my class was being based at Fitchburg State and we found that there was a prominent abolitionist who uh, lived in in Fitchburg uh, in the college neighborhood wow. um, and, and that's basically what they did that summer is they did some research about Fitchburg's connection to the uh, national movement to end slavery and uh, came up with this presentation that I'm about to present to you. Uh, and I can tell you once we get through it, what, what happened after this presentation mm -hmm. uh, was made to the, the mayor and uh, other city officials. That sounds awesome. Um, a couple of quick questions. So this slide deck was created by your students from that year? Yes, uh, the students awesome. in, in summer 2017 created this. Uh, it was a proposal to create a park dedicated to Fitchburg's role in the movement to end slavery. Mm -hmm. And um, students have participated in this project and every semester since. That's fantastic. Actually, my own child was one of the students who participated in this project one year, which is how you and I met. Yes, that's exactly right. Yep. 
Yep, we're talking about you, Clara. All right, next slide, are you ready? Yes. So uh, Benjamin Snow uh, Jr. Um, was a West Fitchburg paper mill owner. He's also the first president of the Rollstone Bank and a city councilor. Wow. Uh, so besides all of that, he was also a leader in the movement to end slavery. He was a, um, he founded um, several organizations in Fitchburg. One of them was the Fitchburg Athenaeum, which I'll tell you a little bit more about as we move forward, the Trinitarian Congregational Church, and uh, the Western North chapter of the American Anti-Slavery Society. He was also, in addition to that, the vice president of the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. And just so you know, if you might have already discussed this with relation to, uh, to Frederick Douglass, but the American Anti-Slavery Society was the, 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 the largest anti-slavery organization in the country yes. at the time, uh, and had chapters in several states, mostly in the North. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, and also, so it had statewide chapters, which I said, as I said, Benjamin Snow was the vice president of the Massachusetts one, but it also had local chapters and the Worcester North included, was based in Fitchburg, but included all of the surrounding towns. Oh, that's very cool. So there, there were people participating in this movement and trying to end slavery um, kind of all around us in Fitchburg. So if my students maybe come from Gardner or Lemonster or um, Lunenburg or somewhere else, um, they all, this, this is their group that was working. Right. They all would have, uh, activists at the time from those towns would mm -hmm. have been a part of the uh, Worcester North American Anti-Slavery Society. Um, before we go forward, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the magnificence of the beards of the 19th century. Um, Benjamin Snow had a very strong beard game. Going yes, on he there. did. Yes, he did. All right, <laughs> you ready for the next slide, David? Yes. All right. So, um, not only was Benjamin Snow um, an abolitionist, um, but before he founded the Western North chapter of American Anti-Slavery Society, he was um, his home was host to uh, or, or what's called a depot on the Underground Railroad. Uh, so. Um, I'll get into a little bit more of that uh, in a few other slides, but um, his whole home was also host. So when they would hold anti-slavery conventions in this area, um, he would host people in his home, including people like Frederick Douglass and Lucy Stone, who was the uh, first woman in the United States to achieve a bachelor's degree, also a, a, a feminist and an anti-slavery activist from this area. It's just kind of mind boggling to think of these giants of American social justice, like being present in this town where we go to school. That's right. Yeah, it's definitely, it's uh, super cool. Um, this connection to Fitchburg, Lucy Stone's uh, brother actually lived in Gardner. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's actually a plaque on Elm Street and Gardner um, dedicated to her work. Yeah, not, not far from Elm Street School. Right, right down the street on the same side of the street. Yeah. And the uh, the other institution, um, or the institution I mentioned, the Trinitarian Congregational Church, I believe there's some um, pictures on uh, in the next slide, but um, the church was established for the sole purpose of becoming an anti-slavery institution. In fact, it was disbanded in 1872, uh, shortly after slavery was abolished in the United States. Um, and uh, that church, so what happened is, um, uh, if, if you're familiar with downtown Fitchburg, um, mm -hmm. there's a beautiful brownstone church yeah. um, across from the Workers Credit Union on the other side of Main Street. I can that see that from was, my window at my house. I right. can see the steeple, yep. Super cool uh, church. Uh, uh, that, well, though the building is cool, uh, the legacy is not so cool. Um, the uh, that church uh, was the Calvinist church that many oh. Fitchburg residents broke from. Um, it was a different building, but um, at the time, uh, in fact, that was as the the former building was closing uh, and going to be demolished. That uh, members of that church broke from it to form the Trinitarian Congregational Church because uh, the pastor and the board of directors at the Calvinist church refused to sign a proclamation. 
condemning slavery as an anti-Christian um, institution. Um, and so, um, uh, basically, that's that's basically how this group formed and, and decided to create its own church. Uh, there's actually a documented history, if you, you can Google it, um, about, it's basically, a, there's a book about the Calvinist history in Fitchburg, Calvinist church history in Fitchburg, and it actually uh, documents that struggle with the uh, board and the pastor. Wow. Uh, it's, uh, I guess it's also weird to think, you know, we think about Massachusetts being a free state and all that, and it's weird to think that there were groups of people and people who were unwilling to stand up against slavery. I guess it kind of shows the um, courage and the gumption of the people who did. Oh, well, that's right. I mean, the same thing happens today with uh, many issues. Um, a lot of people would rather not know. Uh, it's the uh, the definition of of privilege is thinking something's not a problem because it's not your problem, right? right. So, I think you know that's a common thread through our history. Um, yeah. But it's also a common thread that's not celebrated enough. Those the, those who did stand up and had the courage to do so. Um, so this is why this is important uh, that we document this in Fitchburg, um, especially given that. You know, if we do learn anything about anti-slavery movement, we move. We learn about people like Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison, and uh, uh, you know, and others who uh, were seen on the national scale. Similar to when we learn about the civil rights movement, we learn about Martin Luther King, but we don't learn about all the people on the ground. Right. In all so many countries. people. It's, yeah. Um, so. Um, the last part of this slide is uh, talks about a bell, and this bell is really significant. Um, uh, it was a bell that was in the steeple of the Trinitarian Congregational Church. It was purchased um, in New Orleans. Uh, actually, it wasn't purchased in New Orleans. It was purchased in Concord, but it was confiscated by uh, from the Confederacy in New Orleans. Uh, a little bit of history uh, for you all who might not know this, and I didn't know this, a lot of this history until my students uh, started digging. Um, was that uh, during the Civil War, the Confederacy would um, would go on to people's properties and take any metal that they had. Um, so, uh, and what they would, the purpose of that was to, to melt it and turn it into cannons and cannonballs and guns. Uh, and so the Confederacy had actually confiscated this 800 pound brass bell from a, a plantation in Mississippi uh, that used to be used to uh, call slaves to work in the fields and to call, you know, to tell them to go back to work. Um, and um, the Union Army, when it took New Orleans, um, took this bell uh, and others, other things, um, sent them up north to, to be auctioned. And Benjamin Snow <laughs> bought this bell at the time to put in the steeple and actually vowed to that, that the bell would not be rung in the steeple church steeple until every last person is free in this country. And so that bell sat in the, uh, in the uh, steeple of the Trinitarian Congregational Church from the early 1840s until um, slavery was abolished, 1868. In ELA, we talk about the idea of symbolism. And, you know, in literature, a symbol is something that is itself, but it also stands for something bigger. And I just, I think about this bell called Slaves to Work. Is it still in Fitchburg, David, somewhere? No, the, the bell is actually, so when the, when the church closed in 1872, the bell was sold um, uh, to the Air Federated Church. So it's in Air, uh, Massachusetts. Oh, okay. So we have kids from Air. That's also very cool. But like, and, I think, I think about like the symbolism of, you know, it called Slaves to Work. It was there. It was silent until there was something really to celebrate, no more slaves. That's right. Cool. And, and the, other, the other thing that's kind of cool I, um, uh, is that when the bell was sold, the money that was used, uh, the money was used and uh, was donated to the Freemans Bureau, which is a, a organization that existed at the time to help former slaves get on their feet um, uh, following slavery, um, helped with housing or starting businesses or um, cool. making sure they had food and stuff like that. Uh, so it was, it was uh, pretty cool stuff. And actually, the uh, we are working on uh, hopefully getting that bell back to Fitchburg and in this park. Um, I don't know. Uh, it sounds seems like an uphill battle, but we're working on it. Interesting. Uh, That's cool. 
Yeah, definitely. So if you want to move on to the next slide. Um, so these are just some pictures um, and I'll go, go from, let's see. So on the left is the Trinitarian Congregational Church to kind of give you an idea of where it's located. Uh, if you're familiar, it's going to say with Monument Park, which is has an iron fence around it downtown on Main Street. Yep. Um, across from Espresso Pizza. Yep. Um, that's where it was located If uh, for, for our, our parents and probably more likely your grandparents, so the students, um, that building where the Trinitarian Church was, was actually the building that the first Abishan hardware was uh, located. Um, so you can see um, to the left, I mean, to the right of the, um, the original picture, the picture of the church is a picture, it's kind of blurry of that building when it was re, uh, redeveloped as a, um, as a commercial property after the church had closed. And then eventually it was the Abishan Hardware, or Central Hardware. Is it well, that then? church was on the site of Monument Park. Yes. And then it became the hardware store, and then it was raised and became the park? No, no, it was raised and it became the building below that, um, which was built in 1989. So it was raised in, uh, in 1988 or 89. Okay. So, um, and to the right of that picture, above um, is the Calvinist Congregational Church mm -hmm. uh, before it was raised in, uh, in, the 18, in 1843. Mm -hmm. uh, and then under that is the church as it lo exists today. Right. Very um, familiar. And then, and then under that is the bell, uh, pictures of a bell uh, that are in steeple in air. Very cool. Yes. So, so like, when I walk, I can't walk my dog in Monument Park because there's no dogs allowed, but I walk him around there and like I'm walking around a place where William Lloyd Garrison spoke. That's right. And Frederick Douglass and Lucy Stone <laughs> and, and Sarah and Angelina Grimsky uh, and many others um, uh, who, who were part of the movement at the time. That I blows my it. mind. I walk it that way every single day and I didn't know that. It, it, it completely blows my mind. Out of coolness. I'm fangirling right now. No, I, I, I think it's super cool too, because I you know, it tells you that, you know, you know, I grew up in Fitchburg, didn't think it was a very important place growing up. Um and uh and, and today I think even more so, um, you know, with a you know, a lot of businesses closing and so on, it seems a little kind yeah. of uh, downtrodden but if you if you went back you know a hundred or so years this was the place to be this is you know people uh, famous people from across the country thought that this was a place to to move people and to to meet um with people who had influence right so this is a, this is an important um area in that time period um oh, in the 18, yes in the 1800s you ready for me to go forward yes so um, I mentioned this already. Snow um, established the Fitchburg Athenaeum. Uh, this was housed in the Fitchburg City Hall. Um, it was actually, uh, to be, be honest, it was basically like the wealthy people in the area had sort of a club that they'd go to. And they would have like these intellectual conversations about issues affecting the community at the time, uh, like slavery. Uh, and so they had their own library. In fact, the, the books in that library were donated to the Fitchburg Public Library when it was established by uh, Rodney Wallace, uh, which is the Wallace uh, Library. Um, and Rodney Wallace's son was actually married to Benjamin Snow's daughter. So there's, there's, there's some history there. Oh, uh, like you, you think about like these big prominent families. Right, exactly. Connections. And actually, um, the uh, the stairs that went to Fitchburg High are called Wallace Way, and I, um, actually that's Wallace. The street where the church was is called Wallace. At the time, it was called Church Street because it's Benjamin Snow's church was there, the Trinitarian Church. Yeah. Uh, but um, the um, Athenaeum um, also hosted speakers. So um, I don't know if anybody's been inside City Hall. It was kind of drab the last time. Um, and actually, uh, I, I wasn't very supportive of the city hall being revamped, um, but uh, because of the amount of money that's going to go into it. But um, the city hall has this also this great history. And um, when it was reconstructed in the in the uh, 
1960s, they basically destroyed the integrity of like what it was like that it had this uh, amphitheater. So it had like balcony seating and it had an amphitheater and they would hold these, have these speakers yeah, that's like- cool. Philip, I know, I'm, fan, I'm fangirling again, looking at these list of speakers. Right. Oh my and, gosh. Yeah, and Wendell Phillips wrote, uh, I think it's a, is it a letter or the forward inside Frederick Douglass's uh, book um, uh, narrative? The forward, and, yeah. And I think, I think he wrote it at the time because, um, uh, as you can imagine, uh, former people who are formerly enslaved uh, had a hard time uh, gaining uh, legitimacy, right? Of people. Of would, course. You know, so they wanted to have. Nobody wants to. Nobody wants to share what they have. Right. Well, they want, and, and I think they, you know, you wanted someone like Wendell Phillips to kind of give him like a, a letter of recommendation sort of, yep. right? Saying, this guy's legit. You need to listen to what he has to say. Yeah. Or William Blake Garrison, right? Uh, who also wrote in, in the same book. Um, and, um, and of course, that's also uh, it was, it was surrounding race, right? He's an he's a African-American guy. And here are these like prominent white guys or mm -hmm. well-known guys, you know, that kind of, I guess would give him legitimacy, um, but also in in the Athenaeum, you know, you have uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, and others who were uh, around the time. Um, actually, I don't in this presentation; it's not in here. But um, uh, Benjamin Snow is actually really close to Harriet Beecher Stowe, who oh, really? wrote uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was uh, the first best-selling, I think, one right. of the best first best sellers in the in the country. I think sold over a million copies, um, and that um, there's a connection, there's a direct connection, which I'll get into in a minute, um, cool. between Uncle Tom's Cabin and Fitchburg. Um, but um, the uh, the other thing uh, is, many of you might have seen the film in 2013 that came out uh, called uh, 12 Years a Slave." Um, which was about, um, if you haven't seen it, it's about um, someone who was born free, living in upstate New York, who was kidnapped uh, or tricked into, uh, uh, they told him he was going to play, he played violin, and they told him he could play in the carnival or the uh, circus, and then they kidnapped him and sold him into slavery. Uh, when Solomon Northup, who was the person that that story is based on, he wrote a slave man narrative, uh, narrative of, of his experience uh, at 12 years being enslaved, um, that that narrative was turned into um, the play, he wrote it, called The Free Slave. And actually Solomon Northup would go around the country performing in the play as himself. Um, uh, and on the next uh, slide, if you could go there, um, that play was actually in City Hall in Fitchburg in October 1855. This is a full page ad in the Sentinel and Enterprise. Uh, basically, uh, one of, part of the slide says, the veritable Solomon will be at the door. He alone is worth 25 cents a sight. Uh, super cool stuff. This is actually <laughs> you know, a list of like all of the, the acts of the play and, and who, would, wow. who the actors were and so on. Wow, it's so powerful. <laughs> Isn't it? It is I was so amazed that the more you know students uncovered, I was just kind of dumbfounded. Um, I really didn't think it was the history was this deep. Um, so, um, in terms of his home being housed as a, as a, a or a depot on the Underground Railroad, you know there were many people who came through um, mm -hmm. that he housed and put up and fed um, that had escaped from slavery. Um, David, can I were, pause you for a second because I, we yeah. haven't really talked about the Underground Railroad. Um, and basically it was a network of safe houses, right? That's so exactly. you would so, start out in the South wherever you were um, and th these safe houses might have like certain signals outside that let you know that this was a safe house and you would get directions from the previous to the next. And so you'd go from place to place and there'd be like a, like a secret room or a hiding place. Is that accurate? Right. Well, sometimes there were secret rooms and hiding places, and sometimes, you know, every, every people people just went in a normal bedroom or a mm -hmm. um, or you know, and ate dinner with uh, with a family that was hosting. But yes, um, there was uh, there were known routes um, that you know people would pass along. People, I think of someone like Harriet Tubman, um, who 
uh, was told by an ally, um, a white ally, um, about the route. Oh yeah, you got to go to so and so's house, and then she'll tell you, you know, where to go next. Um, and um, and then she went back. She actually made several trips back to the south to yeah. to get her family and friends. And then eventually, her story is even more is really cool. Not even more, but um, but anyway, I won't get into that because there's no not really a direct connection. No, but it's something kids might want to look into. I, I also oh, yeah. want to make a connection because before we worked on Frederick Douglass, we read the Diary of Anne Frank, and okay. you know, talking about people who make the choices to disrupt their own lives, maybe take on an element of risk. Um, especially if you were harboring slaves in the South, um, to do the right thing. Um, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and it's, I just want to make um, that connection. And, and, you know, it's, it's interesting because, um, and I was going to talk about this with regard to um, Shadrach Minkins, but, you know, there was a time when, yes, it was uh, much safer to go to the North. And, and once you got past that Mason Dixon line, right, the, the line that, demarcated the south and the north um that um that people would be safe and they could live semi-normal lives right and get jobs mm -hmm. and stuff like that and then in 1850 there was a law passed by congress and signed by the president that said if you know that someone has escaped slavery it's your responsibility as a citizen to turn them in and to basically um because they're criminals right so they the 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 government redefined it as a criminal act and that was part of you know uh you know what happens in congress is there's negotiations right so you have representatives who are pro-slavery and representatives that weren't and so they they came to this compromise that you know uh that they would make it law that people uh would have to turn you in or you would get fined or go to jail for not turning in people who were um who you know had known had escaped from slavery um, Boy, that connects to the Anne Frank story. Exactly. Yeah, because it becomes criminal. Everyone becomes criminalized. Um, so um, Shadrach Minkins, and I'll go back to Josiah Henson in a second, but Shadrach Minkins was one of the first people arrested under the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, he uh, had escaped slavery and been living in, in Boston and working as a barber uh, for about you know 10 or 15 years or so before this law passed. Um, and um, he basically, he was arrested, someone turned him in, and um, this is a really cool story too. Um, while he was in court being tried, right, and probably going to be sent back to his uh, former master, uh, he, there were a group of black activists in Boston that broke into the courtroom, kidnapped Shadrach Minkins, like took him by the head and ankles, carried him to the streets, and there were so many protesters against the, uh, the uh, Fugitive Slave Act in the street outside the courthouse that the U.S. Marshals just said, wait, oh, we're not going to do anything because they were afraid. They were like, we're not going to, we're just going to let, wow. let this group take him away, Shadrach oh. Minkins. And so they took Shadrach Minkins to Concord and then um, they um, dressed him as a woman and they uh, brought him to um to uh, Lemonster, to a woman's home, an ab another abolitionist in Lemonster named Francis Drake. And I would just say, um, what's more amazing than a, uh, uh, any abolitionists, which tend to be men, was abolitionists that were women at that time period. Uh, is it, you may or may not know this, um, speaking to the students, but women weren't even allowed to speak in public um, in this time period. Um, so when women, um, we're also fighting for um, voting rights for women. Um, in that struggle, many of um, the, the uh, women fighting for women's rights also fought for um, the rights of uh, uh, free uh, black people at the time and, and against slavery. Um, and uh, Frances Drake of Lemonster was one of those women um, that was a part of that movement. Um, and there's actually a, there's a house that's actually been renovated or being renovated in, in Lemonster. That was her home um, in Lemonster uh, near downtown. I forgot the name of the street. Um, but um, but that's there's actually reenactments and stuff like that. If you're from Lemonster, you might have heard of this. Um, but in any case, 
Shadrach Minkins was brought to Francis Drake's house, and then Benjamin Snow picked her up, picked him up, uh, brought, um, uh, had dinner at his home, um, and uh, brought him to a meeting of uh, anti-slavery activists in West Fitchburg um, at um, Samuel Crocker's home. And you probably heard Crocker is another name in Fitchburg that's well known, also an abolitionist. Um, and they they passed around a hat to give him to give him some money. And then they brought him um, up to the railroad into Ashburnham and then uh, out, basically out to, uh, to uh, Vermont by train. And then he, cro he actually waited until uh, Lake Champlain, which is huge, if anybody's right. ever been up there, um, to freeze and then walked across the lake to freedom in Canada. Oh, that's powerful. <laughs> yeah. What a and, journey, and it came right through Lemster and Fitchburg. Right, yeah, and uh, you know they were a key part of this, um, uh, his, you know, getting him to freedom. But it was just an example, a well-documented example of um, one of the people who um, Benjamin Snow and Francis Drake helped yeah. um, uh, to freedom. Um, the other person uh, on this slide, Josiah Henson, and here's the connection to Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, by the way, is, was very influential um, in getting uh, uh, white people at the time to um, have some sympathy for people who are enslaved and kind of brought the um, brought a vision, right, of like what it would be like uh, to be enslaved in the South at the time. We, um, we, we've been talking about um, the persuasive devices, the like rhetoric um, that Aristotle identified and one of them being pathos and drawing on people's heartstrings. And I think storytelling has a big part to do in that. And so I think when Uncle Tom's Cabin was released, it, it allowed people to personally connect and understand a story that maybe they didn't have to see the details of before, like you said, that privilege. Um, and I think it built some pathos. Exactly. And um, so, um, Here's what here's the connection. So Josiah Henson, who actually also wrote a narrative about his experience um, while enslaved, um, he had escaped slavery and come to the north and been to Benjamin Snow's house, house and I'm sure many other allies uh, in the north. Um, he would make his rounds to try to collect money to buy his freedom because that was something that you could do at the time. Is that right. you could one of the the routes to freedom was that if you had enough money to buy yourself, basically from the person who supposedly owned you, then you could have your freedom. Um, and so um, Benjamin Snow and his wife and, uh, and the friends in Fitchburg would, uh, you know, just like with Shadrach Minkins, would pull some money to help people um, like Josiah Henson. So Josiah Henson, uh, the connection to Uncle Tom's cabin is that he is Uncle Tom. Um, uh, Harry Beecher Stowe used his, uh, his narrative to help develop the book or the story. Uh, the funny thing is that, you know, uh, Uncle Tom is, and I, I learned this from my students' research, Uncle Tom, you know, was, and I knew this part, but it was, is a derogatory term yeah. basically saying uh, for, for uh, uh, that basically means that the, if you're an Uncle Tom, you're a sellout, right, to your race, you, to, to um, African American race. And Uncle Tom actually, in actual fact, I think that's probably more along the ways that uh, Harry Beecher still presented him uh, kind of as like this kind of pushover or someone who's going to mm -hmm. snitch on the other, other slaves and so on. Um, but in, re in reality, uh, Josiah Henson, uh, in fact, was an abolitionist himself who escaped mm -hmm. from slavery and formed a school for escaped um, slaves in mm -hmm. Toronto, uh, basically helping people to integrate into society and educating them uh, through literacy. Uh, so, um, so we've been I looking at this from the beginning, like this focus on education and literacy as being the way out. <laughs> right. Um, that's exactly that's the story of Frederick Douglass, right? I mean, right. It was it was, a, it was against the law to be educated or to know how to read for for you know for good reason. I mean, I guess for or for or at least for from the perspective of people who own um, slaves, right? Right. It's, because it's, if you read, you might think for yourself. Right. You might exactly. get ideas. All right. Or could start critiquing um, the interpretation you've been told, right? So, um, 
yeah so um, it, yes so if we could um, move on to the next one I can uh, get into so this is uh, this is Benjamin Snow's property as I mentioned he was a mill owner um, so which means at the time period he was um, uh, a wealthy person um, the 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 building on the bottom right corner is not Benjamin Snow's property. His property was demolished. Um, but if you look at the uh, picture in the upper right-hand corner, it's kind of faded in the back. That building appears in that picture um, because it still stands. Um, and um, so the, the map on the left shows you that Benjamin Snow's property was three acres was mm -hmm. between, between Blossom Street um, and North Street on the east and west. Um, on the south side, his property began on Green Street and it went up to Pearl. Um, oh. Day Street ended, okay. Day Street ended at, at Green Street at that time and his building was torn down when the, when the city decided to, um, to extend Day Street to Pearl. And if you don't know, Fitchburg, Pearl Street is where Fitchburg State is. Mm -hmm. Block Street is the street at the end of the bridge where Market Basket is. Yep. Um, um, so that's just to kind of give you an idea. North Street is leads to Fitchburg State, right? It leads to Pearl, um, and Green runs parallel to Maine. Right. Uh, but you can see here um, one of the things, one of the features of Benjamin Snow's property was an apple orchard. I, it might be hard to see. So there was an apple orchard in the front, and actually, uh, people would describe it, particularly people who are you know in route on the Underground Railroad, as the Garden of Eden because it was just like there was this apple orchard and then there was like beautiful floral gardens and so on. And people would enter in there and they know where they were when they got there. Like, Oh, this is, this is heaven, right? This is the place, you know, so that's, gonna, that, that type of figurative language eighth grade, remember is an illusion with an A, right? When you're referring to literature and we can look at the Bible as literature and it is so often alluded to um, garden of Eden being paradise. Right. Cool. Exactly. Who knew the Garden of Eden was in Fitchburg? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and we're, we're actually, as part of the design of the park, we're going to probably have some commemorative apple trees mm -hmm. um, and, and floral. Oh, I love that. Yeah, perennial flor floral garden. I love that. Um, so, here's, um, so here's where a lot of the history comes from, or a lot of the, the documented history that my students found. Um, they found a, um, an essay written by Benjamin Snow's daughter, Martha Snow Wallace at the uh, Fishburg Historical Society. Um, and in that she, she writes this around the time um, that her father's home was being torn down mm -hmm. uh, and writes about this history of the Underground Railroad and the, um, and the people, the prominent abolitionists who stayed in her home uh, that her parents hosted. Um, so you can see Frederick Douglass was there uh, more than once. I, I, we don't have a documented, but I'm sure it was probably closer to like once a year or something like that, um, given the amount of activity in Fitchburg. Um, Lucy Stone, Josiah Henson, Shadrach Ming, and so whom I all mentioned. William yeah. Garrison was frequent, frequently there, and so was attorney Wendell Phillips, who yeah. lived in uh, Harvard, I believe, um, which is okay. not far from- Not at all. From Fitchburg. So, um, so this is what the neighborhood looks like today. Um, it's kind of hard to an aerial photo, uh, but that's basically his property on the uh, west side is Blossom Street. Mm -hmm. On the on the in the north is Pearl. Um, you can see on the east side of this picture the Fitchburg State Rack Center, which is mm -hmm. between Snow Street, which is named after Benjamin Snow, um, and North Street. Um, mm -hmm. So um, if you don't know, this is kind of the area further into the, into the neighborhood. If you go on to the Main Street side, CDS is on the corner of Snow Street. Yeah, that's, I was thinking that, yeah. Uh, and um, uh, what else? Um, I guess that's kind of the marker, the, the closest marker. So CDS is next to Dunkin' Donuts, which is on North Street. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Actually, I, I don't have the picture here, but um, one, um, if you can go back to the map uh, just for a second. So uh, uh, I don't have the picture, um, but Benjamin Snow's property, um, 
it's interesting, like the building, I think the building eventually became condemned. Um, it's some really cool stuff. Like uh, my students found a uh, mass, uh, uh, Massachusetts uh, Supreme Court uh, ruling against uh, Benjamin Snow's wife. Um, basically at the corner of Green Street, there's a property that still exists there, a building that still exists. There was a house built there by their property caretaker so they had people taking care of their gardens and so on mm -hmm. um but this guy illegally built a house on his on their property because um around the time that um benjamin snow became sick he was out when he was elderly um and the wife was away in new, mm -hmm. new zealand she had done some charity work there mm -hmm. um the, this guy decided their caretaker decided to build a house on their property and so she took him to court, and this is a good uh, a documentation that, of what it was like for a woman at that time, uh, a powerful woman, even uh, such as uh, Martha Snow, uh, or Margaret Snow, sorry, sorry um, uh, who was away and someone built a house in her property and she tried to take him to court and she lost. Um, and shortly after that, she started losing all of her property and people were building houses on it. So there's this picture I wish I had on this slideshow of Benjamin Snow's house, which is like overgrown and all the, all the trees are growing in front of it. And there's all these houses built on their property um, after that period. Um, it's really, really sad um, yeah. uh, part of history, but it's, it's the reality. Um, yeah. We talk about people in that time period, like Benjamin Snow and others being progressive but the reality was is that not everyone was progressive or not everyone supported women's rights or or um, ending slavery as we started this presentation um, talking about. Um, so anyway, <laughs> sorry, I throw that aside. And, yeah, uh, and so, no, it's, uh, it is what it is. Yeah, and, and back to the presentation, I'm sorry, I didn't want to keep this slide up because it has like pictures of wine bottles on it. Um, It'll be all right. But uh, this, this, uh, the reason we did this is because we're trying to develop an app. And this brand of wine, uh, which is called 19 Crime, uh, Crimes brand, um, actually has, the, if, you can, if you can see the picture, there are mm -hmm. pictures of um, people who are incarcerated in mm -hmm. Australia by the British. And if you hovered your phone camera over it and you had the app, those images of the uh, prisoners would come to life and tell their story about how they became incarcerated. Ah, I see. Their... So if you have images of the players in the park, you can hover the phone over it. Exactly. That's that's the idea. So we're going to have, we're planning to have a, a laminate, um, uh, I don't know what to call it, uh, kind of a board um, mm -hmm. that's going to be covered by a kiosk so it gets out of the, um, keeps the weather out or keeps most of the weather out. Um, mm -hmm. But the idea would be you can go with your phone and hover over an image of um, one of the people I discussed and it would tell, they would tell, come to life and tell their story. Um, so that's one of the projects that we're in phase three of our parks development are gonna uh, do to basically to get um, actors, local actors to read a script uh, telling those stories. Oh, that's cool. Yes. So if any students at size are, are interested, that might be a way to plug in um, if you're an actor. Ah. You really we actually, I don't know if you're familiar with our drama program at Sizer, but it is award-winning. It's out. Oh, I know. My, I know. My daughter, my daughter, uh, she's uh, about to go in. Well, she's in sixth grade now. She wants to go to Sizer because she saw The Heights. <laughs> yes. So, um, it was amazing. Yeah, so yeah, I'm very familiar with it. Um, Shout out to Mr. Dawson. <laughs> um, so um, this is a, a picture of the lot. Um, there's actually two pictures of the lot. Mm -hmm. One is a fall picture and one is a summer picture. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I like the fall one because you can see Day Street behind it. Yeah. To kind of give you an idea of where we're going to be building this park. Um, if you're familiar with Fitchburg. Great um, spot. Another cool building um, on, um, on Day Street uh, used to be the former Three Pyramids building, which you can see in the background. It has a, wind, uh, a circular yep. uh, window. Um, that used to be a community center in the um, in, in up until the 90s and well actually through the 2000s but not as robust um, and um, you can also see behind there um, a uh, a building on to 50 Day Street which is a um, elderly housing so there's two elderly housing complexes next mm -hmm. door 
there's the 50 day street um and then there's also hotel raymond um so we're actually when we think about not just dedicating the park to the history but also how does the having a park in the neighborhood benefit the neighborhood right um so this this is going to be it's not going to be a playground right it's going to be um a place you know where people can do reenactments it's going to have benches uh it's going to have a beautiful walkway and floral garden and apple trees so it's going to be more of a kind of a place to come and relax and chill mm -hmm. on a nice day mm -hmm. um and so uh we really we are thinking about um the elders in the neighborhood as well as other residents uh, when we're thinking about like how, that. what this might include it's like when you do anything like again i'm going to connect it back to ela like when you write something you think about your audience when you're building a park, you're thinking about your audience, which is the community, and I like the way you're designing it with them in mind. Exactly. And um, there is, there's also Green Street Park is down the street. Well, it's mm -hmm. now called um, Joanne Mama Fitz Park. It was renamed yep. last year. Um, but so so there is already that kind of recreational park, and now this is more sort it of like- serves a different like, purpose. Exactly. Um, so this is a this is a partial list. This hasn't been updated. There are actually about sixty students who have been involved in this project, mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, so this is just the it was a slide at the time that we developed this presentation. Awesome. Thank you. Who have been involved? I'm going to overlay Clara Pavlovsky at some point before yes. I publish this video. <laughs> yeah, she's. Uh, this is. I hadn't updated it. I don't have access at home. I, I'm good. working. I'm working on a Chromebook, and I don't have access to. I hear that. Yeah. Um, so um, this and it's also his another uh, evidence of an outdated slide. Um, this basically is at the time this was developed. We were um, this is this is where I'll tell you a little bit of history of how we came to where we're at now. Mm -hmm. uh, the um, basically uh, the students proposed to uh, the city. Uh, that we would create a park, not on the picture of the lot that you just saw, but on a, mm -hmm. a different lot on 116 Day Street, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which was right in Benjamin Smith's former property. Mm -hmm. uh, that um, lot, um, at the time, the students did the, pres the first presentation belonged to a bank because there was a building there that had been torn down mm -hmm. and um, the bank had a bill basically for, for $30,000 for, for the city tearing down the building. And the bank, after this presentation was first done, um, the city and the bank made a deal where the city grabbed uh, control of the property and the bank was no longer responsible for the $30,000. Right. So what happens when there's a vacant lot in a neighborhood is that the city puts it on what's called a tax title uh, list uh, for sale, basically, to anybody who wants to buy the property. And so what my students did is they stopped the city council from selling it and mm -hmm. from even putting it on that list uh, for a year. We postponed it for a year. Wow. Students would go to present at either the Board of Park Commissioners or the City Council Property Committee uh, saying, this is what we want to do. We want you to set this aside for this purpose, for a park. And the... Um, after a year of going back and forth between all these meetings and being bounced around like ping pong ball, the city ultimately said, no, we, we don't want you to do this. Um, and they kept giving us excuses as to why. And we kept coming back with uh, a plan to address uh, whatever their concerns were. And they still said no. Thankfully, Pittsburgh State University was uh, one of the vice presidents there was in the audience at one of the city council meetings and the next day he called me and said we want you to develop this park on our property on snow street uh so that's why that's where we're at now um fitchburg signed a, a memorandum of understanding i was going to say mou but i think most people don't know what that is nope, uh, but get what you're saying now uh, a memorandum of understanding which basically says we own fitchburg state owns the property uh, but we're giving you the right to develop the property into a park dedicated to the abolitionist and underground railroad movements. Um, so uh, on our end, we students um, created a group called the Friends of Fitchburg Abolitionist Park. Mm -hmm. uh, Clara was involved um, mm -hmm. in organizing our first annual meeting where we elected a yep. board of directors. Um, thank you, Clara. Um, and uh, the group signed an agreement um, that we uh, would raise the money to develop the park um and Fitchburg state on as a as an added bonus to this agreement so that they would maintain the park 
after we develop it. Wow. Which means as part of their own property. So Huge. mowing the grass, picking up leaves, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, we are responsible if it's vandalized, we have to replace stuff. Yeah. Um, but other than that, it's our sole responsibility is to, to develop it. Um, and so we are raising money um, and get uh, mobilizing community members and students to um, re-envision and envision the park, what it's going to be, and um, try to uh, apply for um, uh, grants and um, ask individuals to purchase bricks in the park that are going to kind of go on the walkway or to purchase uh, the uh, uh, benches so we we'll have a plaque with someone's name on it so on and when you say purchase they don't actually own it it's belong it's right but it's a way of community. like they donate it and they get their name on it and it's a way exactly. to publicly show support for this really cool project yes and um, I, I guess the, the last thing um, I would end with is that you know we are a community driven pro project uh, so we welcome um, students um, and community members to join if this is something they're interested in I mentioned the possibility of acting uh, that would be connected to the phone app that we have to develop still um, there's also we organized a neighborhood cleanup so we'll get yep. a dumpster from the city and try to keep it clean Awesome. Uh, the neighborhood clean and presentable. We're going to be organizing a block party, uh, so we definitely could use some volunteers there in the in the summertime. Um, there's, and there's so many ways to plug in if you're interested in. Um, uh, and that's what Think Care Act is about at our school. You know, it's about informing yourself about things that are important, and like actually having um, connection. And understanding that it matters and then doing something about it and I feel like um, there, through this project there's a number of opportunities for our kids to think care and act um, so what I'm going to plan to do is post things as they come up if you can continue to let me know um, okay. so that kids can as you say dial in awesome well um, and thank you uh, yeah. and um, the, the only uh, I think there's one slide left and I think it's just the um, citations which I think is important Oh no, that's the inscription. Sorry, let me, let me read that. And I know that you know you all can see it, but this is uh, what the park, uh, this is the draft of what the park uh, okay. would read in, um, in terms of an inscription, a uh, historic inscription. It says, near this location once stood the home of Benjamin Snow, which served as a depot on the Underground Railroad, as well as a host site to many prominent abolitionists who visited Fitchburg in the 1840s through 1860s including Frederick Douglass, Lucy Stone, William Lloyd Garrison, Shadrach Minkins, Josiah Henson, Sarah and Angelie Grimke, Henry Clark Wright, and Wendell Phillips. Benjamin Snow co-founded the Trinitarian Congregational Church, chapter of William Lloyd Garrison's American Anti-Slavery Society, and the Fitchburg Athenaeum, which hosted the play 12 Years a Slave, as well as such abolitionists as Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, Benjamin Snow was born in 1813 and died in 1892. He owned and managed a paper mill in West Fitchburg, was a real estate broker, served as a city councilor, and the founding president of Rollstone Bank, and as vice president of the American Anti-Slavery Society, Massachusetts chapter. He had four children, three sons, and a daughter. Um, and uh, then, the, so that's the inscription. And actually, I think it's evolved a little bit, but mm -hmm. um, it's because there was so much more uh, anti-slavery uh, anti activist activism in Fitchburg um, that um, members of our group really want to make sure that all of it's documented. Well, we revise, um, right? Eighth grade, we revise things and get them right and make sure they say what we want to say. Exactly. And then, the, like I said, the last slide, I think this is important because, right, when you're doing historical research, you, you should um, give credit to um the sources of where we got the information um so uh there it's it is. not just about building credit it's about building your ethos again talking about the idea of rhetoric like you're showing that you have these strong sources that um really bolster your story and the truth behind it exactly so all right david thank you so much for giving us a little bit of your time today um, these connections, eighth graders, are super cool, um, and it's kind of like 
taking the opportunity to thank Karen Ack in support of this park is like continuing that legacy in our community. Um, man, that's power. I love it. Awesome. Thank you so much again. Um, and hopefully um, we'll see so some of you soon and I'll get to meet you in person uh, uh, as I, as you're, as you notice uh, any ways to plug in um, that your uh, teacher here is Pavlovsky um, uh, post. So um, thanks again. All right. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye David. Thank you. <laughs>